You've got to read Galatians. I've been listening. You know, how many of you got the Bible on your phone or something? Get Galatians and put it on and listen to it. When you're doing the dishes, when you're sweeping, when you're, when you're making beds, when you're doing it, just put the book of Galatians on over the next couple of weeks. Listen to it over and over again. Read it over and over again. There's so much life in the book of Galatians. It's totally, totally incredible about what God wants to do in this book called Galatians. Hallelujah. Miguel, would you carefully pick up that stand? The thing will fall off if you don't lift up just slowly. And just bring it forward about two feet. Okay? Yeah, just kind of tip it up and then bring it forward. There you go. We need more. That's great. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Amen. That'll make a better, uh, better uh, broadcast for us. So the book of Galatians, I talked about it about two weeks ago. And I mentioned how Paul is sharing how God revealed the gospel to him personally. Jesus appeared to him. And revealed the gospel. You know, he appeared to him as a light when he was on the horse or on the on the, on horseback on the road to Damascus to go to persecute Christians, and the light was so bright, and, and the Lord knocked him off of his horse, and he was blinded. And then the Lord spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting you? He said, I am Jesus. Jesus was saying, you're persecuting my believers. You're persecuting my family. What you do unto them, you do unto me. You're persecuting me. And Paul was saved and healed and set free and God raised him up. And then for 14 years, the Lord taught him the gospel. Now remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They had nothing written down for the New. He read the Old Testament. In fact, Paul was a Pharisee who had memorized Genesis to Malachi. Memorized it. And so God took this thing inside of him and made it alive. And so when Paul taught, he spoke with a conviction that he knew what he was talking about. In the first chapter, Paul says something in verse 6. He says, I am amazed. I marvel that you have so quickly left the gospel for another gospel. Because what was happening was a group of Jewish Christians who were known as the Judaizers, in other words, they wanted to make you Jewish to get saved, they were going into the churches in, in the Gentile areas and telling them, you have to get circumcised, you have to follow the laws of Moses, you have to follow the dietary laws. You can't eat pork, you can't eat lobster, you can't eat shellfish, you can't have this. And telling them you've got to do all these different prescriptions of the law that they were supposed to do when they were unsaved, when they were Jewish, and which the Bible tells us no one can keep the law. Nobody can follow the law completely. Only one followed the law completely, and that was the one who made the law, and that was Jesus. And so Paul, after planting churches throughout Galatia, it's Asia Minor, after planting churches there and starting them up with Timothy and with Titus and with Barnabas and that, they've got these people coming in where they've been and they're corrupting the gospel. And Paul says something so strong. He says, if an angel from heaven comes down and preaches a different gospel than the one I gave to you, let him be accursed. He said, I'm going to say it again. If anyone, any man, anyone preaches another gospel, let the curse of God be upon them. Because we have to understand how powerful the Word of God is, how important the Word of God is, and how we should know the Gospel. So we're not swept aside into false teachings and fads. How much of the preaching of the Gospel is preached today for money? How much of prophecy is given today for money? They've twisted the Word of God. And Paul says... They are accursed. There's a curse upon them. I pray they repent and turn around and follow the word of God. But I know that many of them won't because they love money. A man came to Peter and the others and said, I've got money. Let me buy this power you have that I can lay hands on people and they can receive the Holy Ghost. Peter said, you and your money can go perish. You can't buy this gift of God. Thank God that man repented. Amen. He said, I didn't mean any harm. I, I'm just, I, you see, he was treating it like it was anything else. Mm -hmm. 
But the gospel is the power of God for salvation, Amen. for eternal life, Amen. for those who believe. Amen. And so Paul is so upset. I can't believe that you're leaving the truth. And then he goes on in this book, in this letter, to lay out some of the truth again and also some of the falsehood, the lies, and to show the difference and to encourage them to come back to walking with God. I want to tell you, anybody who's walked with God, anybody who's backslidden, anybody who's turned away from God, pray the mercy of God upon them that they can return to the Lord and walk in the power of God. The Bible says, I am married to the backslider. You see, God doesn't let go of people. How many of you ever backslid? You can raise one hand if you did it once, two hands if you did it twice. Yeah, amen. We, yeah, we've all gone back. We've all gone back. We've all returned to our old ways. And yet God gave us another chance. By the way, this month of February, in the theaters, is a movie you need to go and watch. It's called Samson. It's a fantastic movie. It's made by Pure Flix. They made God's Not Dead. They made The Case for Christ. They made so many great movies. God is doing so much in that company. What a privilege it is for me to know the COO and, and other top leaders in that company and be privy to what's going on. They send me information right away. I get the trailers of the movies before they're released to the public so I can share them with ministers across the country. But this movie, Samson, is fantastic. Samson is the message of a second chance. We need a second chance. Amen. Amen. And so Paul now starts to talk in chapter 2. He begins to get into things. And in the first 15 verses, he starts talking about how the Judaizers are putting the Galatians, the people in the land of Galatia, the whole area. It's like a state, let's say. They're putting the people in the whole area into bondage again. And when Peter went to Antioch to visit the church there, Paul was there, Barnabas was there, and Peter was there, and Peter was eating with the Gentile believers he was having lobster and he was having ham sandwiches. He's doing everything just like God said. Eat anything you want because it's all cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But then when some Judaizers came in from Jerusalem and they visited, Peter dissembled. You know what that means? It means he fell apart. And he left eating with the, the Gentile believers and he only hung out with the Jewish believers. What kind of believers are separating into two groups and saying, well, we can't eat with you. You're a Christian, but we can't eat with you. Because you're, you're, you're not really, you're not, you're not fully a Christian because you're not Jewish yet. But if you become Jewish, then you can be a real Christian. And Peter, afraid of what they were going to say to others, afraid of his reputation. Now, wait a second. I mean, this is the Apostle Peter. This isn't three days after he's saved. This is 14 years or more later. He's been preaching the gospel all over the place. He's been healing the sick. His shadow touches people and they get healed and miracles take place. He's preached the first gospel message. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls came to Christ. And here's Peter. And when Peter feels a little pressure coming on, what will they think of me? What will they say about me? He splits. So don't feel bad that you quit. Don't feel so bad that you kind of closed your mouth when you were talking about the Lord and somebody came by and you quit like, I better be quiet. What will they think of me? Don't feel so bad. You're in pretty good company. So Paul, he goes to Peter and he says, he says, I went to Peter. I rebuked him right to his face. He said, hey, Peter, let me ask you a question. How come last week you eat with all of us over here and enjoying lobster and ham sandwiches? And this week, when these guys come along, you won't do that. And Peter gave the old Jackie Gleason. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. He had no answer. Now, I don't think Paul rebuked him in such a way as to embarrass him badly. But I think he did it in such a way that he was able to touch his conscience and also let others know that this was not the gospel that they learned. And so Peter straightens out, thank God. After that, we hit verse 19, and here's what he says. Let me read from verse 16. He says this, he says, Knowing this, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith 
in Jesus Christ. Even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, we have been justified by our faith in Christ. What does justified mean? Just as if I had never sinned. I'm justified by my faith in Jesus. That makes, that makes it just as if I never sinned. Hallelujah. So I sinned yesterday. I blew it. Did a big one. I did this or I did that. Whatever you might have done. But when you come to Christ and ask for forgiveness, He justifies you again. And it's just as if you'd never sinned. So He says, By the works of the law, no one, no one shall be justified. If we seek to be justified by any other means, then I'm destroying what I built. He says, but through the law, I found out that I'm dead. In other words, you can't keep the law, so you're under the curse of the law, and the curse of the law, the sentence of the law, is death. He says, so through the law, I found out I'm dead. What do you mean, I'm dead? I think you know what I mean. Hey, buddy. I heard what you did over there. You're dead. What does he mean? He means you're as good as dead. Because he's going to kill you. So Paul is saying, I found out I'm dead. Now, I'm not physically dead. But I might as well be dead. Because the law is going to get me. The law is after me. And I can't be justified by the law. I can't keep the law and be okay with God. Nobody can keep the law. So why did God break the law? We'll get to that in a moment. But he says here, he says, through the law I found out I'm dead. He says, so that I can live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in my fleshly body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a scripture we need to memorize ourselves. I am crucified with Christ. That means so much. How many of you ever had a complaining spirit? You know, you're just complaining, complaining, complaining. I can't believe it. Things, everything's happening to me. This is going wrong, and that's going wrong, and my teeth are bad, and my eye busted up my right hand, and I'm glad to this, and the car broke down, and I haven't got money, and then, and then, and then. You're not crucified with Christ. Because if you're crucified with Christ, you're dead. And if you're dead, you don't complain. I said to a, a Christian leader one time when I was a young Christian, I was going through some serious problems in my mind. They might not have been too big for somebody else, but for me they were serious. And I said to this leader, I said, how long do I have to go through this? And he said, until it doesn't bother you. I said, oh, I better get over it quick. I better get over it. I can't believe what she did to me. I can't believe how they spoke about me. I can't get over it. Get over it. That's my counselor. People don't like me to counsel them. Can I get counseling from you? Yeah, oh, don't, don't ask Bishop to counsel you. Why? Because he just tells you one thing. Get over it. Are you born again? Are you saved? Do you know how to pray? You're not a tither, are you? Because if you were tithing, you'd be having the joy of the Lord. You'd be, you'd be glorifying God. You'd be saying, God, I, I know you're going to take care of me. You can't be a worshiper. If you're a worshiper, you'd have the spirit of joy upon you. And you'd be saying, no matter what goes on in my life, I have found myself to be content. I'm happy in Jesus. I've, I've had nothing and I've had a lot. Now I've got nothing and I'm happy anyway. You see, Christians don't complain. Except for those that are saying, no, no, don't crucify me with Christ. No, don't take that hand. No, no, I, I can't take this. Hey, get over it. Grow up. Shut up. Stop complaining. Quit your belly aching. However you want to say it. You have not shed blood in your walk with Jesus. Paul was able to say, I have been whipped with a cat of nine tails three times. 39 lashes. I have been stoned and left for dead. They threw me off the wall of a, of a city and left me there for dead. I've been shipwrecked. I've been bit by a snake, had a fever of 104, 107, 
died right there, but God raised from the dead. He says, I've shed blood. He said, don't anybody talk about me. I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in my body. He's got scars to prove he's a Christian. He said, you have not yet shed blood. You don't have no right to complain. Wow. That's how it is. It is powerful. That's powerful. Ooh, we need the gospel. We don't need this namby-pamby, you know, baby Christian stuff. Mm. Oh, that's okay. God will take care of it. What if he doesn't right now? What if he lets you suffer? Huh? Suffer? Yes. To prove that you have faith. You're suffering with joy. You're suffering with praise proves you have faith. Because your faith is worth more than gold, which has to go through the fire to get purified. You see, now some of you aren't going to read the book of Galatians. Because <laughs> you're not ready for this gospel. Yes, you are. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You know what that means? He doesn't say I live by faith in the Son of God. He says I live by the faith of the Son of God. Which means that Jesus believes in you and that's why you're alive. Amen. Jesus believes in you. Jesus gives you strength. Jesus is the one who lifts you up. Jesus is the one who heals you and settles you and strengthens you and gives you everything you need in life. You live by his faith, That's right. not yours. Amen. In fact, any faith you got, you borrowed it from him. Mm -hmm. That's right. You heard it and believed it. It was him speaking. We got to live by the faith of the Son of God. You see, because your faith is not enough. Jesus said, if you had faith, the size of a mustard seed. What was he implying? He was implying you don't have faith. Mm -hmm. If he says, if you had faith, that means you don't have faith. Because yeah. if you had faith, even a little bit of faith, you can move a mountain. But you see, most of us have nothing but mind stuff going on. Yeah. Mental assent. We assent to it. We, we, we accept it mentally. But man, when it comes to living it, many of us don't have faith, really. Mm -hmm. Because it's proven. Because the minute we go through trials and tribulations, we start moaning and groaning. Yeah. Yeah. When you go through a test, you get the moanings. Yeah. Instead of a testimony, you just get the moanings. Yeah. Amen? Right. You can go through these things. And then he says this. He says, listen to this word. Verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. <clears throat> Do you realize your complaints frustrate the grace of God? Wow. Wow. Do you realize that when you put a puss on, when you've got an attitude, you frustrate the grace of God? What does that mean? That means you stop the flow. The grace of God is flowing to you. He says, if you're going through a trial, come to the throne of grace to receive help in your time of need. But when you moan and groan and complain, and when you talk about others and you point at somebody else, and when you put the blame on somebody else, when you do these natural things, you frustrate the grace of God. You stop the flow. And now you're on your own. And now you've got a reason to complain. But you better not complain. You better not pout. You better not cry. <laughs> Wait a second. That's another gospel. I... Do not frustrate the grace of God. My wife would say to me in our early years of marriage, you're just faith in it. Not faith in it. Faith in it. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, you're just doing the opposite and calling it faith. I said, no, I'm doing the opposite and it is faith. And you stick around with me long enough, you'll find out it is real. It's not faith, and I'm not making believe. I live this life. I live this life. I serve God, no matter what. I know he loves me. I know he loves me, and he'll take care of me. I know no matter what's going on in my life, he knows about it already. There's nothing I can inform him about. That's why prayer is so messed up. People think praying, got to tell God what's going on. He knows what's going on. When your kids tell you what's going on, and you know what's going on already, what does that do to you? It gets you frustrated. 
Honey, I know what's going on. I know. But mommy, but mommy, I'm telling you, Johnny was doing this and that. I know what's going on, honey. I'm going to take care of it. But mommy, you don't understand. Shut up now. Maybe you don't say it that way. That's the way I learned it. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> but you get frustrated. And when you say to God, oh God, oh God, blah, 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 and oh God, this is God saying, I know all about it. How does this make you feel? Lord, I feel like garbage. All right, let's deal with that. I'll take care of the other stuff too. But let's deal with you. Let's deal with how you feel, how your reaction is. What do you think about what's going on? Well, I think it's terrible. I do too, but let me tell you how I think about it and what I'm going to do about it. Did you read my word today? Did you get into the word today? Did you get anything inside of you that gives you inspiration? Did you eat your breakfast? Yes. Did you have your lunch? Yes. Did you have your coffee? Yes. Did you have a snack? Yes. Did you go get that donut? Yes. Did you have a second one? Well, yeah. Yes, you did. And did you have your dinner? Yes. And did you have? And did you watch your TV program? Yes. And did you, did you, you did everything you want to do, but did you read my word? Did you do the one thing that you need to do to put grace inside of you, to put life inside of you? Well, I was really busy. Yeah, I know you were really busy. Stuff in your face but not your spirit. Amen. Hello? Can I talk to you like this? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, as a parent, I'm talking to you like my children. Amen. But I don't want you to be children. I want you to be men and women of God. Amen. I want you to stand strong in the Lord. I want you to be able to stand up and say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. In every situation, I give thanks unto God. Do you want to know the will of God? This, this young man of God that was kind of like over my life as a young Christian said to me one day, he says, you want to know the will of God? I said, absolutely. He says, you want to know the will of God in every situation? I said, definitely. He opened up the Bible and he flipped to a verse and it said, in all things give thanks for this is the will of God for you. That's heavy. Hard to digest. That's deep. In all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you. I do not frustrate the grace of God because in all things, I give thanks. Thank you, Lord, for all the problems that I'm going through. Thank you, Lord, because you count me worthy. You see, this is the problem that we have. The Bible says when you're suffering for Christ, you have been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. So when you're suffering because of your testimony, when you're suffering because of the things you're doing for Christ, then you're worthy to be counted as a true Christian. The, the devil comes around to God and says one day, well, what's going on here? What's happening there? And God says to him, uh, have you seen my servant Job? He's a believer. The devil says, let me get my hands on him. We'll see what happens. God says, all right, go ahead. You, you, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And that's what Jesus said. He says, don't worry. Nothing is going to kill you. That's right. What you're going through is not going to kill you. What you're going through is just an opportunity. Picked up a young man for church the other day. Took him with me to Brooklyn when I preached in Brooklyn last Sunday. He needed to go to church. Picked him up, brought him there. And when I dropped him off, I said to him, don't forget got to do this. He said, I'm going to set my alarm clock. I said, don't set your alarm clock. And he looked at me. I said, alarm means danger. Set your opportunity clock. Because you have an opportunity in every situation to praise God. Amen. Folks, we have an opportunity in every situation to praise God. In all things, give thanks unto the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again I say to you, rejoice in the Lord. Always. And what will happen when you are, are walking with God like that? And the peace of God that goes beyond understanding will keep your heart and your mind in Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me and pray for this?